Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. And what you're about to see is a pre-recorded training session we did over in the United States. Uh, but be assured that the a lot of the material that we cover is really applicable to any automotive applications. So uh, just be aware that, it, it, yes, it, it is a lot of North American vehicles, but they will apply a lot of the same principles apply over in the UK as well. Now, if you do have any questions, if you're watching this during the premiere, you can just uh, leave it in the chat. We'll be monitoring live chat. If you're watching this after the premiere, then just feel free to leave a comment underneath the video and we'll get to those as we can as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's diagnostic technical trainers. I've been in the training department since 2013, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep at Snap-on, so I had 30 different franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru, so I worked in a dealership, and over time, I guess, just became the default dyad guy in the shop. So I always ended up having the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my mind. Then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic today is code-based diagnostic workflow part two. So if you were with us last week, we talked about using a good standardized diagnostic workflow. Uh, so to recap what we were talking about, you would intake the customer. You want to make sure you do a pre-scan on every vehicle, right? You want to make sure that you're scanning all modules for codes because some modules can throw a code and not turn on a light. So we want to make sure that we are checking those. We also talked about how it'll upload free to the Snap-on Cloud, and we can share that as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, then after that, once we've gotten the pre-scan and shared the results with the customer and gotten approval from the customer, then we would go through our diagnosis phase, right? So we're going to go through and determine the cause, and that in and of itself is a whole other workflow in there. Then after that, we'll repair whatever we come to as a conclusion. We'll go in and fix the problem. Then once the problem is fixed, we'll go in and double check, make sure, are there any resets, relearns, recalibrations that need to be done on the system? And it's not just for things you might think of, say ADOS, right? ADOS, just about everything needs some sort of a reset or relearn or calibration. How about an oxygen sensor on a GM? You have to reset the heater circuit. How about you know any host of other things? If you're here right at the very beginning, we looked at that EVAP monitor test, right, to make sure that EVAP monitor runs. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of those, you know, you might need to do a recalibration, a reset, a relearn, and you have to look up and find out where that happens to be, right? Then how about a uh, post scan after that? So after we're done with the recalibration, we'll want to clear the codes, take it on a nice road test, make sure we set the monitors, and then we'll do that post scan to verify that there are no codes left over in the vehicle and that uh, the vehicle's in better shape than it was when it came in, right? So that's our base workflow. And then last week we focused on the diagnosis portion, right? So we wanted to gather our information once we find a code, determine an action plan. So through our TSBs, we looked at TSBs, uh, that actually fixed the PO300 code we had because we had two codes in this vehicle, right? So the TSB addressed one of the problems, a missing clip on, an, on a plug wire. And then we need OEM info wiring diagrams and torque specifications and repair info and diagnostic flow charts from them. Real world repair info, looking at our sure track graph based on over 1.3 billion repair orders. Checking data stream, what is the computer telling us it sees based on condition? Functional tests, turning things on and off. In this case, what we're working on this week or from last week is we had a PO446, a vent valve code, do a functional test on that vent valve and it did not turn on or off. We weren't able to cycle it using the computer. Then with component testing, by actually testing the voltage at the component while still cycling it on and off, we were able to verify that yes, indeed, that solenoid had an internal issue. It wasn't letting voltage go through the solenoid to get to the computer. Uh, so by doing that, we verified the failure. So now we'll get to our repair function, which is where we're going to talk about and focus this week. So we need to make sure we order the correct part. And that sometimes can be a challenge too, because we know over the telephone, sometimes if you call in, 
you know, it might be difficult to order the correct parts. We want to maybe minimize those errors. And then we'll replace it per OEM instructions. And then we need to verify that repair after the fact. And we don't just throw the part in and send the car down the road, right? We want to make sure by doing a component test and a functional test, we want to make sure that we can turn it on and off and the component functions as expected, right? So that is where we will bring us to after repair after that. So once we have verified that it is complete and the new part fixed the problem, then we'll clear all the codes. We need to find and perform any resets, relearns, or calibrations for the problem. Then we'll take a road test to set the monitors and then we'll do a post scan, which we can also share with our customers. And we'll also attach that uh, post scan link to our repair order as well before we finalize it. So with that, let's pick up where we left off. So we left off with our scan tool hooked up and we had verified that the part, the component had failed, right? The, the vent solenoid valve had failed. So now I need to look up a part. So I'll pull up my shop manager. I have my repair order down here for this vehicle. You can see it's diagnosed surging, chugging. Uh, Pre-scan link is right there. And then now let's order a part. So we look down the bottom here, I have links to miscellaneous part catalogs. So we have the best parts catalog integration in the industry, by the way. Uh, but you can click on it and it'll bring you to the online ordering for that particular uh, brand of parts house. So here is, let's uh, verify our car here. This opens up on another screen for me. So I have to slide them over. Okay, so here I am in CarQuest. I got a CarQuest down the street. So I just plugged in there and I need to look up this part. So that is under, well, let's see. Did I click too far? No, I did not click too far. That is under fuel and emissions. There it is. And then under fuel emissions, EVAP control components, go in there. And then we see our list for the vapor canister at the top, the vent solenoid, the purge valve, and then the vent valve itself down there. So if we look vapor canister vent solenoid, we got this one from BWD. If I click on that, it gives me a picture. So there's my picture right there. And I can see, it uh, looks like there's the solenoid and then it comes with the filter. So this big long, uh, per, uh, flex hose, I guess you could call it. It's got the filter on the end. And then we have a hard nylon line that goes over, must be to the canister, right? So that's uh, what that assembly looks like. If we look at Dorman's, should look very similar. Uh, so yeah, it looks very similar. It just doesn't have that loop-de-loop -loop in there, right? But it, it, for all intents and purposes, I'd say that'd be the same. Uh, so there's my filter and there's my hard line there. And then we could also look at just the solenoid itself. So that's down here. And we can see it's a mounting bolt. And then we have, uh, that must be probably where the vent filter goes and that's probably where the hard line goes or maybe vice versa. And then the connector is down here as well. So if we need to adjust the solenoid and we didn't want to worry about uh, replacing the lines as well, which I think if you've dealt with any of those quick connect fittings and those lines there, you, you realize that they tend to break after a while, especially if they've been on the vehicle for a bit. Uh, so I am going to order uh, this one right here. So we'll get this Dorman part right there. I want one of them. I will check it off and then I will transfer it over to my repair order. All right. So we got that. All right. So there we go. So there is our, uh, vapor canister solenoid quantity of one and then sale price versus the list price there. It doesn't mark up for me and now I'm ready. So I, we can order it and, uh, order the parts in. You can do that electronically as well through the parts ordering window which is over there again, there we go. So I can order all those, hit order parts. And oh, I gotta do a price check first, there we go. Okay, well, it's because I'm in demo mode then, all right, cool. So we can order the parts right from there and then the parts will come in all right, through my whatever parts house I have. So let's say the parts came in and then I need to know the repair procedure, all right? So I can go in and look up my repair procedure. So I can go into my repair information either through my scan tool if I have that option or through uh, the web browser, which we could do as well. I'm gonna pull up my vehicle information. All right, so it's an LTZ. There's this vehicle. And then we'll look up our EVAP event. All right, vent solenoid replace over there. And then we have our, uh, let's see, our OEM testing procedures. 
we can go in there. It's going to walk us through how we would test it. And it's going to walk us through how we would replace it. It's just one bolt. It's in the back of the vehicle. All right, so we have that information there. How about labor? How long is this going to take me? We can do a labor time as well, either through here or through our manager system. So we go in, look for labor. Looks like it's eight tenths. All right, so it's not going to take all that long. Looks like it's eight tenths. Okay, cool. So I have all that information. Now I would go and replace it. Take my eight tenths, replace it, come back here to my scanner. So once that's done, and I would need to verify that problem, right? And now I don't have codes, right? Because we, we clear the code, so we wouldn't have any codes. Uh, but I, I, I want to verify that that new part fixed the problem. So I'll go back, back into my scanner where I was, go into engine, and that is a functional test. You can go in and that is called an output control. And if I look, there's my EVAP vent solenoid there. Notice how many different functional tests there are on this vehicle. And if you were with us last week and you remember, you know, that brought it down to four tests out of this whole list. It brought it down to just those four. So we didn't have to search through and find this vent solenoid valve. All right, there we go. Go in to my vent solenoid valve perform my functional test, I can set it to venting and not venting. And once again, since we're wirelessly connected, we can just go underneath the back of the vehicle, put our hand on it, go to venting, go to not venting, make sure whether or not it's clicking. And in this case, let's say for the sake of argument that it is clicking. But of course, we also want to verify the voltages are correct because we can have problems with parts brand new out of the box, right? pretty sure you may have gotten a brand new part in a box that didn't work at one point in your life, right? So we're going to go into our guided component test. Out of the 5 million guided component tests, we have our vent solenoid test for this particular vehicle, and we can do a DC voltage test. So yellow to vent control, black to known good ground. We should see 12 volts on both sides when it's de-energized. And then when we energize it, we should see a tenth of a volt or less on the controls. So let's say we hit view meter. Once again, automatically sets the voltage range where it needs to be, automatically sets the time base where it needs to be, and I am back probed at the uh, vent solenoid, which is this one right here, and on pin A, so I'm getting ignition voltage, right? So 12 volts in my ignition. And then let's undo it, plug it in on the other side. There it is. So on both sides, when it's, when it's uh, open, we have... 12 volts. And if you remember last time, I did not have 12 volts coming out the back side of the solenoid. All right, so we'll just go in and we can check back and forth and make sure that it has voltage on both sides. Now we also want to make sure it's being controlled properly and we want to make sure the voltage is correct when it goes to ground, when the computer grounds it. So I want to be able to do this at the same time while I do my functional test. So once again, we'll pop my meter out. We'll go back over to my scanner where my functional test is. Pull that up, pull up my scope, snap it to the right, snap it to the left. And then if we go not venting, it should be, this is on the control side. And then if we set it to venting, it should see 10th of a volt or less. And we're right down there, right around that zero volt mark. All right, so that means it's working. Set it to not venting, it goes back up to 12 volts. Set it to venting, it goes back down to 12 volts. All right, so that's the way it should be. So we've just verified that the component's working. Now, why did I just test a brand new part? As I mentioned, have you ever gotten a brand new part in a box that didn't work? I think you, you can agree that probably has happened at some point in your life. So we wanna test it. Um, I have also seen, personally, have also seen that uh, on solenoids, switches, motors, if we even have the slightest bit of resistance and it reduces the voltage just enough where it's below the threshold to set a code, you will get a code. Even if it might still technically be working, the voltage output might not be correct. It might have just a little bit extra resistance in there and it brings it down by a tenth of a volt, but that tenth of a volt's enough to bring it down below the threshold to set a code. So we wanna make sure we're not gonna set that code again. Right, so we'll go back into my scanner. Exit out of here, go back a few screens. 
Next thing we want to do is we want to see, are there any resets, relearns that need to be done? So first off, I'm going to clear the codes. We want to do that before my reset or relearn. So I'm going to go and clear all codes, read by code scan here. So it's going to go through, it's doing it in the background right now. There we go. 33 systems, codes cleared in all of them. Hit OK. And then where's the best place to look for any resets or relearns that need to be done? Well, if you have a tool with intelligent diagnostics, it's a quick link right here, service resets and relearns. If you have a non-intelligent diagnostic tool, you could simply go into engine and find any applicable resets for this problem. But in this case, it's just a little bit faster to come in here and have them preset by what did I do? All right, this is by um, this is by job. So we replaced the EVAP vent solenoid. So I go in there to replace an EVAP vent solenoid. It's going to give us any related repairs, uh, top repairs graph. It's going to give us any related TSBs, bulletins, recalls, or campaigns. Looks like there's no related bulletins for this, and that's fine. If I go to functional resets and calibrations, what it does is it looks inside the computer and finds any applicable reset or relearn. Now, in this case, we got just one because there is only one thing we need to do, but sometimes you could get four, five, six different tests in here, depending on what we're working on, depending on how it's related, All right? So we can go into EVAP service bay test here and it'll tell us to run it. So use it to run the onboard EVAP diagnostic. To ensure accurate test results, refer to vehicle specific service information for instructions. If EVAP monitor flag is complete, clear the codes to reset the monitor. Turn all accessories off and set the parking brake. Fuel level must be between 15 and 85%. All right, so what? why are we running this test? This is another one of those tests. If you were here at the very beginning, we had that video, right? So it's another one of these tests that we need to do to avoid spending a ton of time to set this monitor. So I'm gonna go quick back over to my shop key into my repair information. And I want to look up the EVAP service bay test. So I brought my canister over. So I'm going to go service bay tests. All right, so here we are right here. EVAP service bay tests. And it is this one. Okay, so this is how to set all of our monitors. It brings us to an article on how to set all of our monitors. Um, you want to ensure the vehicle meets the conditions for a cold start listed above. So up here we have conditions for a cold start. So ignition voltage needs to be between 11 and 18 volts. Barometric pressure of more than 75 kilopascals. Coolant temperature, intake air temperature, and ambient air temperature need to be between 39 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Difference between intake and engine coolant temperature leads to be less than or equal to 10.8 degrees and fuel level between 15 and 85% as we said. To set the EVAP monitor, it should say yes, but it's not going to say yes because we just cleared the codes, which means we cleared all the monitors. So if it says no, we need to perform the EVAP service bay test if applicable. If it's not available, if we don't have access to this test, which we do, luckily, it may take up to six drive cycles with up to 17 hours between drive cycles for the EVAP system status indicator to transition to yes. That is a long time. It right, could take up to six drive cycles with 17 hours in between each drive cycle. It's pretty much a, a week long process if we need to do this. So we definitely don't want to have to do that. And that's why we want to run that EVAP service bay test to be able to force that monitor in the bay without having to drive it and wait for that long. Uh, in order to go through all of this, we have to make sure, you know, uh, no loads are on the uh, engine, set the parking brake, put it in park. Uh, idle the engine for two minutes, then we run the engine for six and a half minutes at certain conditions, let the engine idle, et cetera, et cetera. It's multiple steps that we need would need to go through six times in order to set that monitor. So that's it's a good thing we have this EVAP service bay test. Let me go back to scanning. Go to EVAP service bay test. Once again, between 15 and 85%, hit continue. Turn the ignition off, wait 10 seconds, and then turn the ignition on. It is important when you're walking through any of these scripted types of tests that we have is follow the instructions. If it says to turn the ignition off, we need to turn the ignition off. It says to pull out the key, pull out the key. Uh, there's certain things that need to be done in order to 
uh, wipe the memory on the computer, cer certain things like that. So we wanna make sure that we're turning the ignition off and waiting the 10 seconds if it says we need to do so. We'll hit continue. Okay, and then it says transmission must be in park or neutral. Apply the parking brake, start the engine, Raise the RPM and hold between 1800 to 2200 for the duration of the engine running portion of the test. So you'll run that engine around about 2000 RPM, I guess would be a good middle of the road there. And uh, it will go through that portion of the test. And then once it's done there, it will go through the idle portion of the test. And all you need to do on this is just watch up on the top of the screen. It'll give you instructions. Since this is a scripted test, it'll walk you through it. Now I'm in demo mode, so this is as far as I can go. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to say uh, once purge is enabled, so that'd be when I'm sitting in that around about 2000 RPM range, this will switch over and allow us to uh, go to the purge section. And it'll just give you instructions on the top of the screen what to do next, what to do next. All right, so we have all the data so we know any reason it may have aborted if we have a problem with it. Why did the test cancel itself? It gives us that reason there as well. Whether the result is in, whether we have it pass or fail or no result. And then anything that's inhibiting the test, if there's a reason there, that they're all data PIDs coming out of the computer. So having this information on the screen is pretty invaluable when we're trying to do this test. And I know I've spoken to plenty of people out there that sometimes this test isn't the easiest one to do uh, just because of all the different conditions that need to be met. Uh, same thing with uh, throttle reset on a Nissan. I think that one takes a lot of steps and they have to be very specific as well. All right, so we wanna make sure that we're just following the instructions on the top of the screen and it'll walk us through the test. So let's say that we're good there. We walk through that test and uh, the test is over and it passed. So now my emissions, uh, my EVAP monitor is set. So we're in good shape there. Next thing we wanna do is take it on a good drive cycle, drive it under conditions uh, according to the manufacturer as it said in that EVAP test uh, that we looked at in ShopKey earlier. Then once we've done that, we wanna bring the vehicle back and do that final post scan code scan. So we'll go into code scan and this time it's a post scan. So we'll label the report as a post scan. It will go through and it will check all 33 modules on that vehicle and a report back whether or not we have code. In this case, all green here. If I go down a little bit further, we'll see that it's all green there on my readiness monitors as well. So according to this, we're good to go. Now it saved it. It saved it to the tool. So I can come down here in my uh, vehicle record, or if I don't have a Windows-based tool, it's previous vehicles and data. There is my vehicle system report. That would be my post scan. I can go in here and there's my post scan as it says right there. Go through, no systems without with codes. Every system has no codes, right? So that's good there. I could print it out from here if I wish to do so, or I can go back to my Snap-on Cloud and share it this way, which is what we're gonna do. So log in. As we've said before, this is free to anyone. Uh, you just need to have a, you register your Snap-on Scan tool with it. It needs to be a current software version on that, on your tool, which is very important. You'll see a little bit more why it's very important in a minute. Um, but you wanna make sure you have a current version of software on your tool. Here is my, let's see, 6.22 p.m., there it is. So there is my post scan here that I just did. Notice how it tags it as a post scan here on the bottom of the screen. I can click on it. It'll open up in a new window. There's my post scan there. I could print it from here since it works in any browser or I can share the link. Right, so if I click on the link here, it gives me three options to share this link. Send via SMS will allow me to send it via text message to a customer. If I have this open on a phone, that becomes active. Send via email will, will allow me to send it via email on whatever machine I happen to be running, whatever the default email provider I have set up in the tool. And then copy to clipboard, which will allow it to copy it to the clipboard, and then I can paste it wherever it needs to go. So we'll copy that to clipboard because I want to put it back in my uh, in my repair order. All right, so we can go over here, pull up my repair order. I'm gonna put in another note right here, notes, and we'll call that a post scan. There it is, save it. 
and we're done. So now I have my, here is my symptom. Here's my pre-scan. There's my part. There's my post-scan. I can then go through and close this out. And uh, we're good there with our repair order. Now all we have to do is just disconnect from the vehicle. Before we disconnect from the vehicle, we want to make sure down here where it says change vehicle, click on that. So that way it will stop communication with the vehicle. And this, this really applies to the wireless tools is it stops communication with the vehicle and it also uh, resets the wireless module so we don't have any issues connecting it to the next car. Uh, so it'll stop scanner communication, hit OK, saves the vehicle record. I have no active vehicle in there and I can simply disconnect from the vehicle and I am good to go. And with that, that is our time here today. So uh, make sure you tune in for new diagnostic content every week. We will be premiering a new video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. UK time. So make sure you check it out on the YouTube channel. If you're watching, oh, of course, you would be watching this on YouTube, but make sure you subscribe, thumbs up, uh, ring the little notification bell so you know anytime we post new content. And it's youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics UK. With that, time for questions. If you have any questions, just feel free. Once again, if you're watching this on a premiere, just leave it in the live chat and we'll answer those. Otherwise, uh, leave a comment under the video and we will get to those uh, as we monitor those comments as well. So I'd like to thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to learning a little bit more about how you might be able to be more efficient at diagnosing vehicles using some of the information that we've given you today. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Hopefully you can watch uh, and see you on any of our other videos. Have a good week. Have a good night and take care.